Uh, I'm very pleased today to get to introduce Dr. Julia Badger from the NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, Dr. Badger is a proje project man I can't do this with my glasses on. Is a project manager for robotics and intelligence for human spacecraft and uh, vehicle systems manager for the Gateway program at NASA Johnson. She serves as the autonomous systems technical discipline lead for autonomous systems. Uh, uh, for JSC, rather, she's responsible for R&D on Robonaut. I think you were responsible for R&D in Robonaut. Uh, uh, things always change. Mm -hmm. And autonomous system capabilities on Earth, ISS, Gateway, and for future exploration, including dexterous manipulation, autonomous spacecraft control and caretaking, and human-robot interfaces. Dr. Badger has a bachelor's from Purdue. Well, nobody's perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, I really should say, and a master, as an MIT person, I should really say, and a master's and PhD from Caltech, and then say nobody's perfect. <laughs> but anyways, we're very happy to have her. All in mechanical engineering. Uh, her work's been honored with several awards, including NASA Software of the Year, that's a cool award, Early Career Award, and Director's Commendation Awards. So join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Badger. Thank you very much. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work we've been doing for probably almost a decade at uh, Johnson Space Center in the uh, realm of robotics and autonomy. So Johnson Space Center is the center for manned space flight, for crewed space flight. Um, so I'm coming to you talking about robotics and autonomy and saying that this is really important to our astronauts that are going out there. And I hope to make the case to you that uh, why that is. So the, the, one of the things that Dr. Aiken said that I've been working on um, and that I've now begun to uh, devote most of my time to is something called Gateway. And this is an artist's depiction of, of Gateway with the um, human lander system, or HLS, um, what's going to take our next American man and first American woman to the moon by 2024. So Gateway is, is kind of a cool little, little thing that we're going to do. It's, like the ISS, um, only it's kind of like the camping outpost that the ISS astronauts go to for their rustic experiences. Um, it'll be around the moon, so way out there. And they're only going to come and visit about once a year for 30 days, for about a month. Um, that's a major difference than what we've got with our ISS, where we have at least three crew members on board ISS at all times, and they need to be there because they're very key to the system, um, making sure that it stays in orbit. We also have a full command center 100% um, of the time. So overnight, there's a, up, there is at least eight people in the command center at any given time. And this is 24-7, 365. They, spend, they send up to, I think it's like 900 commands a day from our mission control center in Houston to keep the ISS aloft. Now, Gateway is meant to be the gateway to the moon and to Mars. It's in the Moon to Mars program at NASA. And it's going to be one of four or five spacecraft flying at any given time. So we have to cut the operational paradigm of what we're doing with ISS and break that for Gateway. So the autonomy part is a really key part to Gateway. We are only going to hopefully have people operating it eight hours a week, so not our 24-7, um, and then 11 months out of the year, it's going to be vacant. But it has all the same systems and all the same capabilities, albeit smaller, that ISS does. So this, this complexity in what we're trying to do and, and all that is, is going to, um, it's going to be a tough job. So I'm going to use the word autonomy a lot, and I like to define it for what it means to me um, because people use it in different ways. And so autonomy for me is the ability to separate my spacecraft and its crew, if there's a crew on board, from earthbound control and oversight. This is important because as we're thinking Mars, there could be a 40 minute time, basically round trip for the, the communications to get there and back. So we can't be relied upon here on Earth when they're going through something that's important, entry, descent, and landing, an emergency, what have you. And so we really have to think about the independence. What autonomy is, is independence. We have to break that link between the spacecraft and the Earth. Um, I have an OODA loop up here, um, observe, orient, decide, and act. It's something that um, the military came up with a while back, and it's 
meant to be the stages of what an autonomous unit, so like a squadron who's cut off from everybody else out in the field, what do they do when they hit something unexpected? And these are the stages that they go through to be the autonomous entity that they are. I break it down a little bit um, and say there's this observe and orient part that's really understanding the state of your system. Um, getting the, 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 the gist of your surroundings, and this can include fault detection and isolation in a lot of cases. And then the second part is plan and execute. You have your decide and act, you really want to understand what you need to do and then have the ability to go and do that. So now that you know what autonomy is, why autonomy. So our spacecraft, and like the ISS, Gateway is going to be built from a set of different contributions from different companies around the United States and around the world. Um, the first three parts are going to be from three different companies here in the U.S. The fourth one um, and fifth one are going to both be from different international uh, space agencies and their contractors there. So this complex system of systems all has to come together coming from all over the different places and will be integrated in space for the very first time. Well, we've done this with ISS. We know what this looks like. Um, the difference is, is that we did it with ISS when people were on board, like doing the actual integration. This time, we're not going to have anybody on board to help us with that. So it's a, something that we have to think about. How do we integrate in this whole other module if another one comes up and, and do that appropriately? Second thing is, is that as you get further away, there's this you know, inverse, um, uh, inverse law is inverse squared law or cube law of how communication comes back. And so it's hard for us to get as much data back as we do from ISS. We have these great satellites now from ISS. We're getting, you know, like 100 gigabit and whatever it is that we're getting down from the ISS. We have all this data. That's going to be tightly constrained once we go to um, the, the lunar orbit. And so we know because I've played with robots before, I know how much data we can produce, and it's going to be a lot more than what we're going to be able to bring down. So we have to have something smart on board that tells us what's the most important things for the people on the ground to know at any given time. And that might change with events and with um, what you're doing at the time. And thirdly, critical functions have some have a short time to effect. And what that means is you could have something happen, and I've got um, some made-up charts there with a red circle in there. And the top one is a, um, is a acoustic sound wave. And so that spike there is signifying something hitting a space station. And then we've got acceleration, and that second one down, and then on the third one down, it's pressure. So say you have a micrometeorite impact, and now you've got a problem. You're leaking. You have a depress event that is forthcoming, and we've got to react quickly to make sure that something that we don't lose all our resources and lose what's, what's going on up there. And so we need something up there that's able to coordinate these types of reactions across the vehicle in an appropriate manner. So our autonomous functions are needed vehicle-wide for both our nominal and our off-nominal types of operations. And this will help us be able to split that or break that tie to the ground um, control. So um, I think it was four years ago or so we decided to think about this a little bit more deeply and understand if we were ready for this type of operational paradigm shift. And so I led a, a team of folks from all kinds of different disciplines across Johnson Space Center and across different NASA centers. Um, JPL was involved, Ames, um, Marshall and Stennis. And we thought about where we were with the state of the art with what we've got on ISS and what what kind of the technology of the day was on what we can do at the time. And so we thought about what are the gaps that we have, these technology gaps that take us from, you know, where we are, where do we want to be. So we took um, a design reference mission that was Martian. Um, so we stressed the system a little bit. We said that they were in orbit around Mars. Um, so there's this 40-minute time delay uh, that came into play. There's also this really cool thing where, like, Earth and the Sun and Mars are all in the same line as a, a solar conjunction. And so you can't actually communicate with Mars for about two to three weeks every time that occurs, every time we're in a line, essentially. So autonomy for that is very stressed, right? That's 
um, for our 500-day crewed missions to Mars, those, those plans that we have, this will happen during those 500 days. And so we took that to heart and said, okay, well, what are we, what are we missing? And these are the things that we came up with. One, integrated vehicle system status, fault response planning and control. Right now, everything's very localized to the system on board the ISS. And so they basically said, oh, you know, this guy, this company designed this ECLIS, this life support system, and they do their own fitter, fault detection, isolation, recovery, but it's not coordinated with the thermal system the next module over, and it's definitely not coordinated with the Russian module, et cetera, and so forth. So there's not really anything like that on board any of our human spacecraft yet. Contingency management across these mini subsystems, um, particularly for our emergencies, the crew is deeply involved anytime there's a deep press, a fire, or anything else, and fires are not triggered by crew being there. Fires can happen anytime you get a short um, in, in an oxygen environment, so we have to be really careful about what can happen on board and what, what we can do, particularly when there's not crew on there or not ground control to be in, in response um, if these types of emergencies do spring up, and they do. They do spring up. We did an assessment on crew responses, and most crew, when they're up there, do see a fire emergency. Um, not a full fire, but something that could have been an incipient fire or what, or what have you. Data management and situational awareness is, are the last ones. Crew is our eyes and ears up there. It is common to hear a ground controller say, can you go check on the status of this switch? Or can you tell me if these lights are on? Or can you pull the, open this door and see if you smell anything behind it? This is a very common occurrence. It happens for those crew members every day. We aren't going to have that on board if we don't have people on board and we don't have robots and sensor packages and hour it is to be able to, to um, take care of that. And then with all of that data that we're now replacing with the human's eyes, ears, and everything into sensors, we have to have a way to be able to accommodate all of that data. So ways to achieve autonomy. Um, system design is what we came up with as a, a major role. There's a lot of different things that are important that you have to think about to make sure that you can design your system for this autonomous operation. Um, Vehicle system management software was what we came up with as the, uh, as the just to feel how we could achieve this. But they're really tied together. So my little boxes that popped up there were really key in importance. If you make your system simple to operate, you have a shot at autonomy software to actually make it go. So you get your simple software out. And so clear definitions of interfaces and independencies was kind of one of the key points that came away with on the actual parts of how you would design that system. But one of my favorite things that, that we came away with was we have to think about, in the very beginning, how we would design this spacecraft for robotic maintenance and inspection, both inside and out. Okay, so that was the boring part. Now we get to, now we get to robot videos, which is what you guys are all here for. All right, so Robonaut 2 um, is a, the second generation of a project that started in the late 1990s uh, with Robonaut one, which you'll see up in the corner, there's Robonaut 1A and B. Um, a is in the Smithsonian, real close to here, actually, um, and B is uh, at Johnson Space Center. The Robonaut 2 started in 2007 with General Motors. Um, they had the same kind of thoughts and ideas of what they wanted in a robot as we did. We wanted something that would be safe to use around humans in a critical environment, so there's stuff that um, uh, could break around it. We wanted it to be able to use the same sorts of tools and interfaces as humans do. Um, for us, mass is a big deal, and so we can't send up a different set of tools for a robot if there's already a set of tools for humans. We want to leverage that and use that. And then finally, do actual real useful work so that um, video that you saw a, a second ago of it messing with a 20-pound weight. It actually can do that. It, it does do that. It's got a grip strength that can handle that, and its arms are even more capable um, than that even. And so we um, developed this and then got a call from the space station program. They said, hey, we've got some space on a rocket, on, on a space shuttle, actually the second to the last space shuttle mission, I believe. And so it launched in February 2011 um, and did some really cool work up there. So I got involved with it shortly after this project, shortly after it launched, and my role was to do the, I was the test director essentially for the test that we were doing on board the space station. So this is, um, this is on ISS, you'll see some astronauts floating around in the background. Um, it is a task board panel. There's a lot of soft goods outside particularly. Um, we at first thought um, Robonaut would be great for 
extravehicular activity or spacewalks. Um, and so we were, were working with some of these soft coat covers that needed to be pulled back to expose things that an, uh, an EBA crew member might need to do. And so it was messing with these quarter turn fasteners and the this, this soft goods material. And I had written some, you know, vision processing in there to try to identify if the quarter turn fastener was already, was, you know, where, where it was so that we knew what to do next and that sort of thing. But largely it was um, scripting and tally operation in the sense of telling it to go here, there, and, and do this next, next thing on the ground. It was painful. This probably took us five hours to do. There was probably four or five of us intense all in looking at that computer screen. You saw those two views that we had, one to the side, one through its eyes. I'm watching it that whole time. It was awful and 100% not the way that we wanted to do things moving forward, which is important to learn, right? You, just, you never know otherwise. So, Okay, so this was about the same time um, as they had this DARPA robotics challenge, and they were thinking and learning some of the same things that we were on that challenge. And so we um, borrowed some ideas that they had come up with about affordances. And so an affordance is how you would describe how an object allow you to um, uh, manipulate or afford a manipulation. And so we uh, developed this uh, approach that basically put models of objects into the same frame as the robot model. We did this in Arbiz. We could put in sensor data, and we could also tie some path planners, some motion planners into it. And so what we did was we encoded in the model of the object how you would approach and grasp. So we had some grasp planning mechanism in there, and we had uh, different ways that you could go and grab onto you know, my water bottle. I can do a couple different ways. Some are better than others, but there's some affordances that it had. We can key all that in there. We added in some, um, some basic vision, so we had some QR um, detection and some, um, some automatic um, object detection, and we thought, hey, this, this might be a better way to do things. So this video is, is pretty old now. It's um, from about four and a half years ago. But this is our, we call medium fidelity mock-up of uh, the ISS, the US lab, where Robonaut was hanging out up there. Um, as you see, he grew a pair of legs. Um, in the meantime, we uh, have launched those to the ISS as well and is integrated with uh, the robot. Um, Long story I'll get to in a minute. But uh, this is how it's meant to climb around on the ISS. These are crew used handrails. And so it goes and it does this path planning over the 58 degrees of freedom that Robonaut is. And we use uh, Lydia Kravaki's group uh, at Rice. And you'll see a little more of her kids' work, her students' work, in a little bit. And then each of the things that it's manipulating here, once it finally gets over to uh, where it's going, has an affordance model. And so you see the screen there. There's three people now, not five. Um, they're fairly intensely watching this process. And they're making sure that, um, for example, models are placed correctly in the environment. So there's some clicking of um, uh, images to make sure that that, that happens. Um, and they're watching kind of as this manipulation unfolds. And as you notice, it's similar to the one I showed you on, on ISS. Instead of five hours, this was about a 25-minute task from the beginning, from climbing over to, to doing this uh, grab of the, the toolkit here. So there, I don't know if it gets all the way to the end, but their people are still happy at the end. So they weren't really super intense, but they, they were pretty involved in what they were doing. So we thought, this is good. This is good. We're, we're on the right direction of with what we're doing here. We're kind of breaking away, doing a little bit more supervisory control with this, and we're doing um, less teleoperation in, 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 true, in a true sense. But then we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I didn't have to tell it to go do that next manipulation every single time it got done with the previous one? So we developed this framework called Task Force. It's a general purpose algorithm design and execution framework. It can be used as an IDE, but basically it gives you the uh, uh, ability to pull in different things from all over the place that you might be developing um, different stuff. It's kind of the glue that holds our autonomy system together. Um, it's not task planning per se, but it does give you some execution power on if you, know, you have a supervisor that's watching something that's going on and it can tell you success or failure and direct the execution and the flow of what you're doing. It can string together these manipulations, and then you can actually kind of come up with a task um, uh, that's more like an activity. So you're not just doing a single skill or single task, and you can um, pull these in from different places. So this is my favorite video. I'll show you more videos than this, but this one's, this one's my favorite. Um, we went a little bigger for our next one, and so now we're talking about, okay, 
Gateway needs to have robots to do logistics management because our logistics vehicles are coming up while nobody's there. So Robonaut is um, using a very simplified version of a hatch. Um, this is kind of cool. It's literally attached in three places, and you see it just moving its torso like a boss to where it needs to go, which we can do, obviously, but it's really hard for robots to do that math. Um, this is uh, students' work from Lydia Kabraki's group and Zach Kingston and her group. Um, also, turning valves that have you know, rotational constraints. We'll see them open the hatch with linear constraints, some really cool stuff. It kind of looks like the robot should just be able to do that. Um, so I like that because I feel like, hey, we must be doing a pretty good job if, if it's looking more natural. The second thing I like is over in that corner there, oh, and Steve showed me how to do this. This guy right here, that's my operator. If you watch him, he kind of pats his head, he drinks his coffee, checks his phone, picks his nose. He's not all in on this. He is supervising the robot. But it's one person, and he's not having a whole lot of work to have to get that done. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the robot kind of keeps going, and it'll come over here to grab this. We call it a cargo transport bag or a CTB. We added some QR markers, or I think they're actually AR codes, to it to make it a little bit easier to grab. It is a white bag. It's cloth with a white cloth handle, so it's not the easiest thing in the world. And it's strapped in with a seat belt, which is very similar to like how SpaceX, for example, will strap in their cargo. So it's, um, we did an assessment on that, and it's fairly close. It's not at all fixtured, and he's climbing over from you know a couple, few meters away, and so he's not fixtured coming up to it. But this part here is actually um, more than 90% uh, success rate of having absolutely zero operator input for it doing its job through this affordance um, and task force uh, combination set. So I'll let it play out so that you believe me that it actually happens. Um, and you will see Logan, my operator, every once in a while have to go and do a little bit of help. Um, it gets, right as it came in here, it gets kind of singular on the joint, and so the path, the motion planner gets a little grumpy about it, so he has to wiggle it a bit. So those sorts of things will happen, but in general, um, very few manipulations from the operator standpoint to make that happen. Okay, so we felt even better about it. That was 2017, I believe. Um, and we started working a little bit further on doing the things that we wanted to do to make sure that we could get this overall um, framework. Because our goal is to have this go do things while we have that eight hours of calm. We want it to be doing things even when we don't have calm. So we dug in, um, we had some money to play with um, some of the AI that was happening at the time, and particularly IBM Watson was interested, IBM was interested in, in helping us with that, so um, we did some work with that. But basically what we did was we said, well, we can come up with this overall framework that we can pull in vision, so we have this vision pipeline where we're doing object classification using some machine learning techniques. Um, we pulled in, um, I don't think you can see it on the, uh, the video here or the picture here, but we pulled in um, speech to text and text to speech and said, okay, now I don't even want to have a computer involved in what I'm doing. I just want to talk to it and, and touch it um, and, and do that sort of thing. And so this, this framework was starting to be kind of the key of how we're going to move forward and, and make this even more autonomous. Hey, R2. Pick up the rest. Don't tell Disney, guys. No problem. Let me try to find the adjustment bridge. So this is putting together that pipeline with the, the speech and the vision. You kind of see the models of the wrench popping up, and it pops onto where he thinks it is. He's thinking about which hand to use. You'll see hands pop up in just a second. I found it. And he lets us know that, hey, I found it. So he always checks his right hand first. It's just biased that way. Um, and see that as the video continues, he'll check both hands to see which one's the appropriate, but since that one got in a high enough confidence score, he just... Can you see the adjustable wrench? You see Phil here gives it a little wiggle. He's got lots of force and torque sensors. Pick up the mallet. No problem. Let me try to find the proper mallet. And so he is just accepting basically that input to like, release the, um, the tool for him. So there's nobody sitting at the computer. This is a still and a tripod and a camera. Please 
using the Watson. So we're actually using the Watson, whatever it is that Watson does on the text to speech. Brad, the branch. For speech to text, we tried to use Watson, but it's racist against Australian accents. And so Google does a much better job with the, the global English, if you will. So we're just showing here that this is not textured at all, that we can put him in any of the positions, and it is trying to do model matching using these, um, this vision pipeline. So we don't always use the AR codes, though you do see us cheat with them on quite a bit. So robots are just one part of the equation and talked a little bit in the very beginning about how, you know, we really have to think about this as an integrated system. Robots are one part of it, but we have to understand the interdependencies and interconnections between the different types of systems and, and think about them as a whole to make everything good. So vehicle system management is something that we started up um, really digging into a few uh, years ago. And so this software is basically meant to think about the vehicle as a whole. Like I said, there's modules coming up from all over, and these modules are going to be tested um, on their own, and then they're going to be tested in a lab setting with mock-ups of the other modules. And then we're going to stick them on orbit, and we're just going to expect the whole thing to just go together. So what we're trying to do is create an, an architecture that allows for that. So we have a distributed hierarchical architecture. We're kind of enforcing different capabilities and functions and interfaces and interdependencies at these various levels. And so we have at the very top our vehicle system manager. Underneath of that, all of our modules will have their own module system manager that will be responsible for all the things that stay within that module's boundaries. And so if there's a fault that you can detect, isolate, and recover within that module, that module system manager, or maybe some system managers below that, those are responsible for that. Only if it actually affects things on a vehicle level would you get your VSM involved. And so this requires this careful, careful design of locus of authority or trying to understand whose, whose scope is what and what levels of abstraction do you talk about your system at at each of these levels so that you're not overwhelming one level with knowing all about the system, but each person, each system manager in this can kind of know something about it. We call this concept the Autonomous Systems Management Architecture, or ASMA, and this is just kind of a conceptual drawing of what one could look like that is not representative of the gateway. But from that, we decided, wouldn't it be cool if we had some sort of framework that would support this architecture? It could be used for different classes of autonomous systems at different levels of the architecture. It could be used for a life support system and for a robot for um, activity like our pod using the GNNC and, and propulsion and the vehicle system manager. So it's um, something called MAST, the Modular Systems, uh, Modular Autonomous Systems Technology. Um, and it is this framework that's going to that standardizes our information sharing and the interfaces. It's based uh, upon contract, uh, assume guarantee contracts or a contract-based design principles. So we are trying to split out these components and then be very formal about what the interconnections are between these different parts of the system. And even internal to the system, we've basically broken up and said there's these different buckets of types of things that you can have. Um, that fit within different parts of these OODA loops. And you may have zero to N number of each of these types of bucket technologies. For example, you might have a motion planner and a mid-range you know, time planner and a long-range time planner or what have you. And those would be three different planner buckets, but each one of those would be responsible for having these tight contracts with whatever it is, is talking to. So um, we also liked this way of doing things because you're we have these really pesky things called crew members that come up every once in a while and screw up our nice little robotic system, right? Um, and so we want to be able to be accommodating to the types of control that they're going to want when they're there. Um, it's going to largely be a lot more um, planned and controlled from the ground when crew members are on board, and that's okay. And so splitting kind of the technologies and how this is happening out allows us to kind of throttle our, our actions. So we can always have the VSM doing things like state analysis and understanding the state of the system, doing projections, doing planning, um, but maybe it's not doing as much execution in different times, or maybe it's not taking control of, of uh, you know, crew timeline um, at all times. And so this framework allows that to happen.
We've done, um, we've done several years of tests on this. We've done different scenarios um, and plugging in various technologies from around NASA and from um, the, the world at large to try to give us a bit more context on, you know, is this the right way to, to do it? Is this um, framework going to work? How do we do these data abstractions? Um, this was, I think, 2018. Teens demonstration. Um, we had a leak detection scenario, so we distributed um, these functions across. To basically, said that we have a have and a service module. We have power on both, and then we did um, a little bit of magic with um, trying to understand if there was a leak. And it was like at the same time as we were on batteries and, and trying to understand what the right thing would, was to do. And so we used some cognitive or learned agents for detecting. Um, the pressure, and it was a water leak, pressure in the water lines, and used the architecture for um, command and telemetry flow. And um, the cool thing now is that in uh, the lab that we have on this um, picture here, we're actually up in this area. We just moved in not too long ago, and this whole area is going to turn into the gateway testing facilities. Um, and so it's really nice that a lot of the facilities that we were using to basically bring these uh, spacecraft subsystems together from the different groups that were developing this new technology is going to now be converted into the gateway lab because we're leveraging a lot of that technology that we've been de developing for the next steps. So. Kind of thinking a little broader at the bigger picture for this, um, I think our lab has been involved in both this robotics and the autonomy, the, the kind of caretaker um, mindset of how you do the spacecraft from a holistic point of view of, of having the spacecraft itself be kind of a, ro a robot, maybe not something that has manipulation capability um, per se, but it does think about things um, in a robotics or an autonomous standpoint, but then having that robot on board. And there's different types of technologies that you kind of flow into each of those each of those things. So you ha might have um, task planning and data management down on the spacecraft side um, and manipulation and mobility on the, on the top side, but really you've got the robots that are a really important part of of feeding into some of the things that you have down below. Um, one of the big uh, use cases that I like to, to talk about is fire. Um, we, these do happen, and they typically are sensed events that aren't real. So you'll get a fire alarm, and it's a false positive. Um, for a gateway, without a human with a fire extinguisher, the response to that is, is intrusive. It's um, typically either you do nitrogen baths or you depress, and so either way, it can be hazardous for crew, so if crew was on board, it's not what you want to do while they're on board, you have to be real careful about that, and if not, um, depressing basically takes your air supply, and it takes a lot of money and rocket power to get air up there, and you don't want to have to restock that all the time for um, these intermittent alarms. So having a robot go, go, go with a thermal camera that might be pretty heavy and not capable of being arrayed like put all throughout the, the vehicle. Having it go over there and, and take a, an image or even look behind a panel and take an image is a really important step before actually deciding to, to pull the trigger on something like that. And so um, Gateway has been uh, really smart about developing these two things together. together. Um, and so we're, we're going to see that going forward. Um, so space isn't the only place that this kind of stuff is useful, and, and I'm sure you guys know that. You see a lot of this kind of stuff, and there's all different types of industries that need it. Um, we also try to go out and understand what other people are doing, and part of our mission at NASA is not just to help our space exploration is to help us here um, on Earth. And so we have this really great collaboration um, with an, an oil and gas company in Australia. Um, they have these things called uh, not normally manned platforms that are about 70 kilometers off the uh, northwestern shore of Australia. Um, and I'm going to play a video. It'll, it'll talk a lot more about it and um, discuss it a little bit afterwards. So let me let it speak for itself. What's really exciting about coming into technology, a new part of the company, we really see that robotics could be used in many activities to be an assistant to our maintainers and our operators so that they can be removed from some of the more hazardous tasks and allow us to maintain and operate our facilities in a different manner. We're really interested in giving our robots the ability to think and learn on their own to be able to interact better with humans. So our Robonaut is a humanoid form. We 
we've actually got over 300 requests from our operational staff on site to actually bring robots in to help them do a particular task that either is inefficient, it's repetitive, or there's some degree of risk associated with that. Okay, I'm ready. I am now isolating the drive. Now what can I do for you? looking to push the boundaries of science both on and off of Earth. We're all about developing robots to work successfully and safely side by side with people. This collaboration is an excellent opportunity to do so. <laughs> it is cool. <laughs> We took a, one of our robots and we sent it to Australia. It's there on its Australian sabbatical for the next um, almost two years. So it was a five-year uh, loan to them. They've taken that. They've basically gone from being real smart oil and gas people, nobody had a robotics background, to uh, they have robots all over the place. They, they probably own more robots than I do, and I have a lot of robots. Um, but they, they've really, really ramped up um, what they are doing. So we actually uh, started talking through IBM. They were using Watson at the time. They um, were interested in kind of connecting some of their services, not even like some of their offshore services, but really just kind of things like, can I do my, my time card and also get into the leave request system all at the same time. They were using Watson to connect those things, which when you get into the real world, these are like the annoyances that you're going to have. Um, so it was important for their business for that. Um, and so they saw us and thought this would be great because they saw a lot of needs, like Russ said in the video, for things like this. Uh, so we took four or five of them um, for three weeks. We sequestered them in, in Houston. We gave them a two-week course, crash course in robots. And then uh, they had another week, and they developed. That was a, um, a high-power switch, that green thing with the knob and the handle. Um, so what that is is that they have these substations that have enough volts to, to kill you and all your friends um, you know, behind them. And so the people get in full protective gear and have these like makeshift broom handles that they use to actually do this um, switch turning. And so they, they mucked that up in a week, essentially, of time. We shipped the robot to Australia, pulled it out of the box, and they got it ready by the end of that week to show off to high-level folks in their state government and their company's CTO. Um, so it was a really big success from the sense that we took and they did it themselves. We just taught them our tool chain, so basically what I've been talking about here. So these are how you, this is how you would do it, and they developed the models, and they developed the affordances, and they developed the path plans and the grasps and, and the task force libraries um, that they needed to do that in, in that short time and, and made that happen, which I thought was a really cool testament to, um, to our tools. And like I said, they've actually, so since, since this video was made, and we could probably make another one, they have this thing called Fuse that is a lot like our VSM that they now use as their remote operations um, standpoint into seeing what their plant is doing from day after day is basically they have operators who live a thousand kilometers away that go walk around and check out sensors and whatever else and and make things happen and their vision is to incorporate robots in that to just basically say oh, that that's a little off I want you to go and and give that knob a turn and, and deploy a robot there and, and have that happen so um, it's a pretty cool project and it's a lot of fun to, to collaborate with them so future plans, um, what, what's happening next, just to have a little bit on that. So we are working real hard on, on Gateway right now. So we've decided to make this VSM a real thing on board Gateway. It's going to uh, control the whole stack. Um, we're uh, building it in-house at Johnson Space Center, which is a lot of fun. Um, my team's in charge of the design and the verification of that. We have a flight software team who works very closely with us that actually writes the, the code, but we're in charge of the algorithms um, and those sort of things. And so we are, we're working on really the bottom right there, um, smart spacecraft and incorporating those technologies uh, right now to make it happen. For the robot side, robots are going to be a little bit delayed. They're going to come up and right after boots on the moon happen. Um, we're taking a little bit of risk with that just because there will be time when nobody's there. But we are developing the, the hardware right now and influencing the environment. I would say that influence the environment, we're basically um, most of the way done with that at this point. We're still working on those standards. We're building a grasp adapters that will go into that first habitation module um, by the time it ships and flies. And so it'll be 
stocked and ready for the um, intravehicular robots to come um, when, when, when they get there. And we've been advancing the robots. So Robonaut uh, 2, the, the ones you saw in, on all the videos, it's cool, but it's old. And so we're ready to make a, a different version of it. Um, so we're building that this year and next um, and trying to understand lessons learned from what we've done so far. Um, we've actually, through Woodside, been playing a lot with like UR5s and some of the robot T grippers and that sort of thing. So we've done assessment across a range of robot capabilities from ours and, and, and theirs. And we've picked what we've liked from both. And there's definitely parts from both that are, that are really good. So um, we're taking all of those lessons learned and building on that and um, building on our affordance templates frameworks. We actually have this really nice, uh, we call it um, 3.5 the version that's coming out now and I think you saw videos on versions one and two so um, we've come a long way with it so um, that's been a lot of fun as well oh and, and the robot on orbit I promised I would get back to that so Robonaut uh, came back down a year and a half ago for some refurb and some um, updates and some repairs it was on orbit for a while and then uh, we're sending it back up hopefully in August and it will do the thing that you basically saw where it went and grabbed the bag. We're going to do something very similar like that on orbit, have it climb across and do that. So that increases our technology readiness level of all of the technology we've been developing on the ground over the last few years. Um, and it gets us a whole other version of things to test when we, when we, and learn from uh, when we send it back up there for our eventual gateway robot. So conclusion. Um, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions, which is always good. But future exploration missions, we're, we're really looking into things that are going to have a lot more challenges and having you know assets and spacecraft out there deployed for long periods of time before humans get there. We need something to caretake and maintain those facilities. And so robotics and autonomy are really these key, key enablers that allow us to do this further exploration into our solar system. So interesting questions that we're, we're looking forward to and then trying to figure out is what roles these technologies really can play, how they can become trustworthy, and how we really design this overall system to make sure that we've, we've got it right for teaming with crew members, with robotic agents, and with our, our spacecraft itself. Any questions? In the talk, uh, you discussed about how you use contract based design for your uh, uh, using assume guarantee contracts. Mm -hmm. Could you shed more light about what kind of specification formalisms you use to uh, account for? Um, spatial and temporal tolerances within uh, your design framework? I, I can't really get into the details on that because we're really just making that up right now and trying to understand that. So really what the contracts are doing, and um, it's funny because we use it in two different ways. So as um, a NASA employee, we, we call ourselves kind of at the program level, level two, and we are actually making physical write and sign and transfer money contracts with these um, providers. And part of those contracts are these then assume guarantee contracts where we're trying to be very specific about the data and the command structures that are going back and forth. And temporal is going to be one of them. Um, spatial we haven't even gotten to yet because it's more of a, that's more of a robot type of Thing, and that's phase two, so that's 2025, which is a million years from now. We're focused on 2023 right now, so. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a, it's a great problem. We're, we're working really hard on, on making sure we get the right standpoint of that. Good question. Sorry, I can't dig in more. <laughs> yeah? Um, so two questions. One, you said that the oil and gas company uses Robonaut right now. Um, how do they deploy it to the specific place that they need it to? Good question. They don't deploy it. So they've actually used it as kind of the Cadillac system to learn on, if you will. They um, have been using it to become a, a, a smart buyer for the types of robots they would need out there. And since they hadn't had any robot experience, they, um, they also use it for tours and gaining a lot of interest. And then the whole Australian Space Agency came about while Robonaut was there, and they like announced it in front of Robonaut. So it's, it's been a real big boost, but it hasn't been deployed. And what was your second question? The second question is, um, have you guys used this in any Nemo expeditions? No, we haven't used it in a Nemo expedition. Sending it to Australia was pretty, pretty crazy. We actually thought that was a bit further away in the most part. And then when we, we sent it to the ISS, it was actually closer to us most of the time when it was on the ISS. Um, but ISS is, is kind of like Nemo squared, so we <laughs> but there, yeah. Curious about the future of kind of the humanoid style robot. I like the point you made about the tools. You know, you're only sending up one set of tools. Mm -hmm. 
But I'm thinking about like an unmanned aircraft, you know, when you take the cockpit out, it opens up a whole range of design choices that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access. You know, similarly with spacecraft, um, is there thought regarding the future of the humanoid form factor? Are there, are there other possibilities that, if you, if you, that could be opened up if you don't mm -hmm. go down that road? Yeah, in fact, our next robot is it might roughly look like a humanoid and that there'll be enough limbs that you could kind of look at it cross-eyed and say it is, but it won't, it won't look like this. Um, it won't have five fingers. We've done an assessment. We think two is the right number for most of the things we need to do, and we may need to send up a nice dexterous one for fine things later. Um, but it might even only have three legs because we might not have the mass to do it um, and that sort of thing. Uh, tools is an important thing, though, and so what we're trying to do is say, for like the hatch, for example, is we want to use the same tool set to open a hatch. We're just going to make that tool set amenable to both our robot and to humans. Um, I like to use doorknobs as a great example. Um, in my lab, I actually have a door handle like that and a door handle that's, you know, the circle. Like, they both open doors for us, but robots can use that, and robots are, have a hard time with that you know, door handle. And so just making smart choices like that is where we're going with it. It's like, let's make our robot as simple as possible. It probably won't be humanoid, but let's make it so that we have these human factors and robot factors all kind of into one question. So the rail system is a lot of mass, and you don't get the, the reach necessarily. Um, and then you have to figure out how you're going to charge it. Um, if the rail is charged, that then makes my safety people get all, all upset. Um, so we did an assessment, and we thought, OK, what would be the best? Uh, handrails are not the best either, though they do give you this nice mass benefit because handrails are there for people, and so then we're using it too. And so the kind of the compromise we got to is we have these little, for gateway, these little pucks, basically, that we're going to have a special adapter to be able to key into, so it is like special use for the robot. But we won't have as many, and we'll use things like the handrails, too, to, to make up for some of those um, deficiencies in workspace, essentially. Yeah? So you've done a lot of development for architecture for autonomy with your um, <coughs> Uh, the software that you're using for that. Yeah. Are you sharing that with researchers, or is that pretty much proprietary? Right now, it's pretty much proprietary. There are piece of that, pieces of it that are open source. For example, we have a um, really fast, efficient uh, data logging and uh, display, basically, kind of um, uh, tool called Logger, um, L-A-G-E-R. He was very fan of beer. But uh, uh, anyway, so that's open source, and it's a part of this framework that helps the kind of that, the, the, the data flow across and those sorts of things. Okay. But not all of it is, yeah. I'm thinking about your affordance templates and your task force. Task force, um, I believe both of those should be out literally as soon as we have to, we have to tar them up and send them to somebody before they get open source for us. But I think we're, we're like that close. So they are, they are almost there. Um, but yeah, those tools are almost out. Planning whatever you have developed is, is localized to that particular robot. That's it. Or like, will it interact with, say, if there are other human beings that are on board or that are helping robot to do certain specific task or pointing it towards a specific <laughs> task? Will the control policy be generalized or like, okay, for this specific task on this robot, it does this? That's it. After that, I have to. Um, so. Yes and no. The robot that's doing manipulation will likely not be out at the same time as humans are there. Humans are faster. They are more capable. They are going to be able to manipulate things quick, more quickly. Um, robots take up space. They are slow and annoying. And there's just pretty much not a lot of time for them there, and they're not going to want it. So it's the, the concept of operations right now is that we don't have robots and people interacting on the gateway. They will be acting at different times. Um, if anything, humans will be fixed fixing the robots up there, because we all know what robots are like. So that, that'll be the, more of the interaction. However, the other side of the equation is that the robot that I showed you is just one of the robots. And actually, I have several other videos where we're using um, Astrobe as a robot that uh, was built at the Ames Research Center. It's this 
floating ball essentially that has sensor packages on it. It does have a little perching arm, um, but it's, um, for example, the leak detection case, we've used Astrobe to go and do this simulated, um, it has an acoustic sensor on it and goes and finds, does this little pattern to localize where that leak is and, and using that. And then for um, the bag demo that we'll do on the ISS, it'll be both Robonaut and Astrobe working together. Astrobe will go find where the bag is in the lab, and then Robonaut will go and actually retrieve the bag to that one specific point. And so they are, they are meant to work together, um, not in isolation. And they will be working with the spacecraft as well. So the idea is that, for example, for um, instead of having to do SLAM, you know, literally just turn on the lights to where it needs to go. You know, you can kind of guide a robot with the spacecraft, and you can be real dumb about your robot if you, you know, do a, a couple things that are a little bit easier to do kind of on that spacecraft level. And so we're trying to look at the autonomy from a system standpoint, um, not from, from a, a component standpoint. Part of the question. Yeah. Uh, you said, like, the Great Wave program is, like, 11 months without human beings. So uh, if for a specific task you have shown it took five hours plus and then it took 25 minutes plus and how long are these robots capable without charging and how do they charge themselves if you, there is no human interaction? So some of the docking adapters will be charged and so it'll basically just have a couple of home bases it goes to to, to get on and, and charge. So we're expecting, I'm expecting, and so I'll be real, there hasn't been a whole lot of an engineering assessment behind it, but I'm expecting to be a, a roughly two hour battery where it'll go and then it'll hit and there'll be enough of these charging stations that it's like on the way to something or it does something and goes and hits that pretty quickly um, to do that. So the climbing across, if we were doing it with um, not handrails but these docking adapters, I expect it to be where they can probably get across in about 15 minutes without humans and stuff in the way um, for the size that we're, we've got. And so in a two hour time frame, you know, getting across the, the station and back, you have still a good hour's worth of work to, to do before you need to go charge. So that's not too bad. Yeah? Actually, that was a question I was going to ask. Um, we, we have the robots now that are lo they're doing locomotion by attaching themselves and moving. Um, and you said Robo B is something that doesn't necessarily do that. Is there anything that Astrobe, yeah. just like floats to where it needs to be? And Astro B uses ducted fans okay. to fly. Yeah, and then it'll perch um, and it'll get itself into its charging station similarly. Um, but yeah, so it, it flies fairly slow, but it's faster than Robonaut. So <laughs> we keep telling them that they're fast. They're like, no, this is a sad competition. <laughs> Neither one of us are fast. <laughs> Ask, like, what kind of monitors do you use in the, uh, within the robots? Is it just uh, electromechanical motors that you pull them? Yeah, it's a brushless DC. I think we use Cole Morgans right now in Robonaut. Parkers are the ones we're going to. Um, but yeah. Well, the fingers are a little bit. I think we're using brushless DCs throughout. There's no steppers or anything in there. Um, they're a little harder to control. Though um, our grip, you didn't. You saw them, I guess, on one of the videos. They might have um, steppers. I'm not quite sure. But in general, we, we stick with the brushless DCs. Yeah? How difficult is it to model a human motion and to code a robot to do it? Um, so typically what we'll do if we want our robot to do something human is we stick somebody in teleoperation gear so they literally are the robot and we'll have the robot have them control the robot to do it, and we can record that and play it back. Um, it's not super hard to do otherwise. I mean, you can do sweeps of joint motion, or you can kind of, we just can encode a trajectory so you can have somebody, it, it's not too hard. You can just find, if you find the data, then you can play it back, or you can have it. We don't typically do a lot of learning because of the amount of data that it needs, and we don't have a lot of data where we're going. Um, but yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. What kind of motion planners do you use for Robonaut, and what kind of motion planners like would you use going forward for the next stage for robots? Um, so I think it's Psi by BRT, like it's the um, Strains RRT 2, 1 that they're using, and there's some adaptations to that. Um, so basically, the Lydia Kravaki group at Rice owns OMPL, and so we have her students pick our planner for us because <laughs> they're very smart, um, and, and we, we do it on that. So they've done some work. Um, we had a student in 20, 
16, I believe, who made it so that it could handle, it was called XXL, so we made it so we could put all the 58 degrees of freedom in there and have it, have it do something cool. And then the one you saw in the video that was opening the hatch was another version of that CYBRT and then had it um, uh, some extra sugar on top to make that um, over constraints. So it's basically a lot of work on how do you encode the constraints in the right order so that it respected the right ones first essentially was how he did that. And the second question was, um, I think you said that MAST operates on a formally verified and validated uh, framework, which makes sense for like space applications. Um, how much and where would you expect to include like cognitive or learning um, behaviors? Because I think you mentioned you used it a little bit on a leak detection. Mm -hmm. So where do you anticipate using that? Um, so it's based on a formal verification principles. It's not on a, a, a formally verified architecture. It is a reference implementation, and it is a concept, basically generation type of thing. So the MAST is based on those principles, but has not been formally verified, like the flight software will be. It costs a lot to do it, obviously. Um, the learning stuff, um, like I was kind of saying, we don't have a tremendous amount of data, and we don't have a tremendous amount of processing. And so if we are to use learned types of behaviors, it would have to be something that we could learn on the ground and deploy and have it be from somewhat successful, so largely kind of like a linear regression type of um, thing. Um, maybe some vision stuff. We're actually, that's when Robonaut goes back up, we're going to try out learning something with a vision on the ground and the conditions as much as we can, you know, uh, that are similar, we'll have the same, our certification robot and we'll try to get the lighting right and all that and then see how that, or in simulation for example, and see how that applies in space. Um, as you saw in one of the videos, there's there's that view that was all pixelated and crappy. Yeah, that was, that was you know, regular little video cameras that can go in ahead in space. <laughs> That's how they get, so it's it's not the same it's not the same quality as you get here on the ground, and so we're going to see how that works. Are the interface standards you're developing extendable to, say, like dusty and dirty environments, say, like the lunar surface? So we have, um, my group does not do that, but uh, the group across the hall from the Robodot group is building a rover that will go into these permanently shadowed craters on the moon, um, and so they are very worried about dust mitigation. There's a whole section of science on lunar dust and how to deal with it. It's, there's simulants and all these things. It's, it's amazing. I, I learned a bit about it um, recently. So I don't, but some of us do. Um, are you planning to use the Gateway IBA robot while the crew is there? And if so, how did you sell safety on it? We are not planning on doing it while the crew is there. However, safety, we have safety on, on Robonaut. We are using Robonaut right around crew, and we don't have a button anymore or anything else like that. And so we do have a two-fault tolerant design for excessive force. Um, so you guys were talking about that, um, but we do it with with force control. And so it basically is it doesn't have to think about it. It just never, once it approaches some amount of force, it stops itself. But Robonaut does it automatically pretty much because of the series elastic actuator. That control. helps a lot, yeah. Um, are you going to basically mandate that on future robots? It's likely to, we will go that direction for future robots for inside because it's not just humans that we were worried about. We're worried about the interfaces that it's touching and, and all of all the structure. Outside it's a little easier. They, they make everything outside amenable to what that robot's force can do. Inside is not the same thing. I mean, you've got laptops, you've got all these things that, are, that might be critical, but they're, they're small and they're not going to live up to that same thing. And so we have to be amenable to that as well. So. How many cameras are there on Robonaut 2 and are there plans to upgrade it to increase its field of view, for example? There's not really, we, we've upgraded ones that are on the ground to things Sensors in sensors that you use on your robots now typically are bad at radiation testing. So they, they don't do well, particularly the type of flight ones. We've actually just recently sent another set of them back through radiation test, got better results, so it's been five years. Um, it's got two analog cameras that we can see through, like if we're gonna be teleoperating, two machine vision cameras um, that uh, we use for that in the head. A time of flight sensor, the one on orbit, has a Swiss Ranger, which you probably, are, I, mean, I don't even know if you were born at the time, it was, it's pretty old. <laughs> and in the feet, they have um, one uh, video camera, uh, a giggy camera, and then a, a small time of flight sensor called um, a um, Camboard Nano. Um, on it, a PMD, and those those survived um, tests. We had 
a while back we were, you know, doing, um, it's called an ACES. It hard latches up like immediately in, in, in radiation environments and that sort of thing. And so we don't have the best time of flight, though there are things out there now that, that it would be. We're not going to update the one on orbit. We're hoping that we have that one up for there for max two years, bring it back down and send the one that we're building right now up um, that will have those upgraded sensors. Big questions, guys. Three o'clock, so let's thank our speaker.